next session now uh, which is titled wings of literature which will have mridula garidji jason grunbaum and rachna yadav discuss the importance of literary journals and translations and they'll be in conversation with malvika banerji uh, i'll just give you a brief uh, you know two line bio of our panelists mridula garidji is a hindi writer who has penned numerous books which include novels short stories plays and collections of essays she has received among others the sahitya academy award and a helman hammond grant for courageous writing by the human rights watch of new york jason grunbaum is a writer and translator whose books include oday prakash's the girl with the golden parasol his work has been shortlisted for the dsc prize in south asian literature and he has been awarded the global humanities translation prize rachna yadav is a professional kathak dancer and choreographer but in 2013 she took over as the managing director of hans which is the largest literary magazine in india with a wide and diverse readership they'll be in conversation with the director of the literary meet who's malvika banerji a round of applause for our panelists please Good afternoon, friends. Uh, welcome, Mridula Ji, Jason, Rachna. It's an absolute honor to have Mridula Ji with us. Uh, uh, she was. Uh, we were trying to get in touch with her for a long time. There was another festival in Ranchi as well where we wanted her. So I hope this is the first of many visits to the Tata Steel festivals. Now uh, the the discussion is about the wings of literature. and uh, literature has wings in its own it's inherent in literature but for it to travel it needs uh, it needs a different vehicle one is one is the vehicle of translations which uh, jason and uh, mridula ji have done in the past in uh, various levels and the other wing which we are uh, worried about because it's being a little clipped of late is the literary magazine and this is not an indian phenomenon across the globe magazines where which people turn to for knowing what is new in literature who are the writers who are bubbling under to find a short story by a writer they have admired for years all these qualities which a literary supplement or magazine brought to our lives you know as you look into magazines mainline magazines the number of book reviews have lessened literature is sidelined and possibly this uh, this other wing or the third wheel that's coming into the story are literature festivals because at least in their coverage one does hear about literature in mainstream media so i'd like to start with uh, rachna because her translation of the hans uh, magazine is this book which we will launch later in the in the afternoon is uh, what what brought this eminent panel here so can you talk us through the inception of hans and uh, your your plans for it it's on Hello everyone. Thank you, Malvika, for uh, inviting me here and having this session. <clears throat> As uh, the lady uh, who announced the this panel said that Hans uh, is today the it is the largest literary Hindi literary magazine. What does it mean? We'll come to that later. What does the largest thing mean? But um, it was actually started in 1930 by Prem Chand, uh, the legendary author Prem Chand. and it uh, in fact it had uh, the good uh, it also had mahatma gandhi at one point as the advisor to the editorial board it was a fairly big magazine fiction based though but uh, social causes because those days the, the national movement and all that was at its peak 
So it was a very, very strong vehicle for, uh, you know, revolutionary ideas through fiction. Thereafter, with the, the demise of Prem Chand, it kind of staggered along for a few years, and then it stopped. It uh, closed down. Uh, in 1986, uh, my father, who was an uh, author, revived it. He actually had been planning to launch a magazine. It was his dream to launch one magazine. He was trying this project uh, with you know various people trying to tie up because he needed finances. Then somehow he came upon this idea that he wanted to revive Hans. Uh, why and how, honestly, I don't know. Why Hans, maybe Mridula ji may know, I don't know. But I don't know why he decided on Hans. But he did. And I just remember I was in school that time, and uh, we went to Premchand's son's house for a discussion of, uh, I think, getting the rights. Uh, and I just went along because uh, I had to go somewhere else. So <laughs> I just tagged along with no interest in what was happening. However, Hans started in 1986. It was relaunched. And this is probably one of the very few literary magazines, maybe the only literary magazine which has come out for 33 years without even one issue not coming out continuously. So which is quite a big thing. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, it was his dream to make Hans the magazine, the, the literary magazine which reaches out to every possible reader. And I think he managed to achieve quite a bit of, of that. He had some of the best writers writing for Hans. Hans had some of the best stories that got published, and it became fairly iconic. It kind of became like an institution, you know, where lots of uh, uh, socio-economic debates, literary debates were initiated uh, in Hans. And it was almost like a, uh, a representative of what the literary background or literary uh, environment at that point in time was. We lost uh, Rajendra Yadav, who was my father, in uh, 2013. And that's when I took over as the, manage, as, as the managing director or the manager, not the editorial team, because that is not my line. As you were told, I'm a Kathak dancer and a choreographer. Had very little to do with literature, although both my parents are uh, writers. But my father was a writer, my mother is a writer, but somehow I never engaged with literature. And till the last minute, I used to fight with him that I am not taking over Hans. So you figure it out. And he would say that, look, I've put in everything. You know, let me, uh, you have to take care of it. You have to not let it die. And I said, you find someone else because it's not me. And uh, I was telling Jason that when he passed away in 19, uh, 2013, he passed away on 28th of October. And 1st of November, we were in office. And not even once the thought that we should now close it down crossed my mind. I just, it was such a seamless taking over. Uh, see, it looked seamless, although it was a big struggle for me because it was completely new. For four years, I'm still struggling trying to figure out Hans and the whole literary scene. But I have a very strong editorial team, and Hans is going on strong. So that is what journey of Hans is. Having taken this, am I taking too long? I think I'll just come back yeah. to you after this. Uh, so, uh, Ridula ji, your generation must have grown up reading writers like Prem Chand, reading Hans itself. So was it an aspiration of yours as a young writer to be published? Because earlier, uh, we had a session with Ruskin Bond a couple of years ago where he said these magazines were the place like junior statesmen where, where writers kind of cut their teeth. So was it that way for you? Actually, I started writing in, uh, is the mic working? No, I don't know. Do I have to put it on? Okay, I started writing in uh, 1972 and uh, I was first published in Dharmyog Saptaik Hindustan and Sarika. My first story was published in Sarika. At that time, there was no Hans. Uh, then my first uh, novel was published by Rajendra Yadav. He also had a publishing house called Akshar Prakashan. So he published my first novel. That was in 75. And then in 86, I mean, that was 10, more than 10 years later, the reason he uh, wanted to revive Hans was that Hans was called a progressive magazine. Pragitishil. Patrika, Pat Pragitishil uh -huh. Vicharon ki Patrika. That's what Premchand had called it. And that's exactly what Yadav wanted to do. So he thought, why not revive Hans? 
And once he got the permission, was it Amrit Rai or Shripat Rai? Amrit Rai, uh, Premchand's son, uh, it was smooth sailing. Well, really not smooth sailing because there was always a financial constraint, a very big financial constraint. And uh, Manuji, Yadav's wife, probably gave all her earnings to Hans and whatever savings, little savings Yadav had, because he hardly had any savings, uh, were put in Hans. And uh, there were some other uh, good Samaritans who contributed to the finance. And, uh, but as Rachna said, not one issue was ever missed. During the emergency, it, it had already passed the emergency period. But Yadav was hell-bent upon criticizing the government, upon every subject. And for some reason, nobody arrested him because they didn't want to make a martyr of him. That's what I used to tell him, that the only reason they have not arrested you is because they don't want you to be a bigger figure than you already are. But the Hindi writers, it was a big thing with them to be published in Hans. I got published matter, of course, you know, the second issue of Hans uh, published by a story. And, Which year uh, was that? Yeah. Roughly when? It was in 80, uh, 86, 86 uh, second, uh, every month. It came out every month, so the second month. It started in which month, Rachna? August. August. So September, my story was published, and it was called Shaher Ke Naam, and it was rather long. And Yadavji and I had a running battle, I mean, running argument all the time. So he said, uh, see, you are a friend, that's why I wasted so much of, so many pages of Hans's. I said, well, the only reason Hans sold was because my story was there. So, you know, like that. And he was a great one for a party and for wit. I remember he rang me up on my 40th birthday and said, Kab marogi? When will you die? That was his birthday wish. <laughs> so I said, not before you. <laughs> so, you know, he put all his wit, all his uh, lust for life. It was not only, only zest, it was a lust for life in the magazine. And the stories were freewheeling all kinds of kachra, you know, all kinds of things that people were, you know, sort of persecuted for, were published in Hans. And uh, he never asked a writer why he has written what he has written. Everybody had total freedom of expression to write in his magazine. And, you know, one thing uh, which I remember with great uh, affection is that you could criticize Yadav in Hans. He would publish your uh, write-up or letter and he'll fight with you orally, but never in the magazine. I remember I wrote uh, an article in which I said that a very uh, famous editor returned a story uh, and he's supposed to be fighting for women's rights and he has written this, uh, he's returned this story to the author and that shows just how fake his uh, um, fight for women is. So he thanked me up and said, Aray, galati ho jati hai. People make mistakes, you know, like that. And he published that uh, article, and it was my sister's story. And she rang me up and she said, you write nonsense about an editor, and he publishes it. I said, yes, that's the great thing about Yadav. And this I have not seen in any other editor. And now, of course, that kind of a liberal outlook is totally scarce, totally rare, totally not there. So there's a warm personal memories of uh, Rajendra Yadav. Now the other wing, as we said, is uh, translation. And uh, we thank the University of Chicago for having writers come from there. There's Jason, who's a translator, and Wu, who came and spoke here over the last couple of days. So, uh, you know, from the outside, how does the health of translating Hindi look? Because you're, 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 you're getting an inside-outside view. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, actually, if I may, uh, first, if I could uh, just briefly talk about my personal connection with Hunts. Um, and in a way, I could say that I might not be sitting here today if it weren't for Hunts, because the very first novel that I translated was Ude Prakash's The Girl with the Golden Parasol, which was published as Pili Chaturwali Larki in the 25th anniversary edition um, of, of Hunts, or it was started in the 25th anniversary edition, and then it was uh, published uh, serially. So 
even when I was a student and I was beginning to study Hindi literature, um, Hunts was this incredibly deep and wonderful and magical sort of treasure trove. I remember, you know, many days in the stacks of the library kind of going through the archived um, editions of them. Um, and I mean, really it was um, the kind of blueprint for uh, discovering Hindi voices over the decades. Um, so the health of um, Hindi literature in translation, um, to your question, well, um, so very few, and, and for, for now I'm just going to be speaking about um, translations that make it into the US uh, and UK markets. I mean, as we know, in many, by many accounts, translation is flourishing. Um, in India at the moment, we just saw that both the DSC Prize and the JCB Prize both went to works of translated literature, not from Hindi, um, but, um, and, and also we, for those of you who are here earlier listening to Aranava Sinha, who is, you know, sort of a one-man uh, Fort William College uh, worth of uh, translation from Bangla literature. Um, but, you know, Hindi literature, uh, actually The Girl with the Golden Parasol, by translation, was the first Hindi novel written by a living novelist to be published in the US in over a generation. Um, and just let that sink in for a minute. Um, this is, by some accounts, the second most spoken language in the world. Um, imagine saying that about, you know, Japanese or, I mean, even Hungarian, you know, such a small language would sort of uh, blow Hindi out of the water. And this goes for South Asian languages in general. Um, in you can pretty much say that in a good year, there are about four or 500 titles translated into English from all languages and all genres into the US, which is, as we know, and to the detriment of humanity, very famously, a monolingual um, society. Um, and even within those, you know, let's say three or 400 titles, only about five or six titles come from, forget about Hindi, any Indian or South Asian language. So again, we're talking about languages that represent a fifth of humanity, um, and so few voices uh, make it into the English language market. Now, of course, um, there are many Indians who are familiar with traditions of the you know, so-called vernaculars or bhashas, um, certainly much more so in the West. Um, and the situation is better over here. Um, but in the US, translations from any language are kind of a fight. Um, and translations from South Asian languages, um, ironically, suffer from the fact that there are so many wonderful writers, Indian writers, South Asian writers, writers of the South Asian diaspora, who write in English so beautifully. Um, so when you're pitching a project to a publisher, um, that sort of literature is a little bit more of a safe bet, whereas it's, it's, it, it can be more difficult um, for them to, quote unquote, take a risk on translation. Very briefly, though, having said that, the situation is also improving in the US. Um, Arunava has several Bangla translations. Uh, Vivek Shambhag's Gachar Gochar, uh, which was translated from Kannada, um, had made a big splash and was a huge success in the US, if anyone has, I mean, it was a huge success here too, was also translated into Hindi and other languages. Um, so slowly by slowly, slowly uh, the, the situation is starting to improve, uh, mostly because uh, good works are finding good translators, editors are becoming more aware of the different voices that ought to be heard from different literary traditions. I okay. want to ask a question, Jason. Please. You said very few South Asian language works are translated. What about Japanese? What about Murakami? <laughs> oh, I could, I could, I mean, I don't know how depressed you want me to make everybody. Well, it's not depressing to say that Murakami has been translated so, so well and so robustly, uh, but I, I keep track of the numbers here, and it's something like 0.0003% of all literary works published in the U.S. come from South Asian languages, and again, this is, um, for one-fifth of the world's uh, you know, population. One of the reasons, of course, is let's take Korean languages. Korea has a very robust government institution called the Korea Literature Institute, which basically is a very well-funded um, institution that's devoted to training translators, a kind of a matchmaking service between translators and writers. Um, they help subsidize sample translations for publishers. I, I just will stop you there because we are Thank getting you. back to uh, India. So that's the story in the US. 
but uh, do we really need uh, to look that far? How is it going in India? Well, in because India, if we translate it huh. within ourselves, if languages didn't use the crutch of English to translate from one to the other, wouldn't we be in a good place? I think the largest number of translations from other Indian languages take place in Hindi. Much, much larger. I can't tell you how much larger. 300 times, 400 times, 1,000 times, or 10,000 times. Like Jason, not being an American, I don't dabble in figures that well. But uh, it is many number more, a number much more than in English. And uh, any writer like Nimade, who got the Bharti Gyan Peter Award for Hindu, was simultaneously translated in Hindi. Uh, he was simultaneously translated in Hindi. Nimade, his Hindu in Marathi, which got the Bharti Gyan Peter Award. Then uh, the Bengali writer who wrote Dozak Nama, Bal something, what is his Ravi Shankar Bal. Huh. Ravi Shankar Bal. His uh, novel also got translated into Hindi almost simultaneously. And I read all these, and of course, the older writers were always translated in Hindi. In fact, for a long time when I was a child, I thought that Sharad Chandra was a Hindi writer. And later I learned, no, he is a Bangla writer. So uh, translations into other Indian languages are there, but mostly in Hindi. Uh, of course, Sharachan was translated in all Indian languages. But the modern writers are translated in Hindi. The only thing is that we somehow feel that if we are translated in English, we would have a world market, which balloon Jason has just pricked. You don't have a world market if you are translated in English. You are only read by non-Hindi speaking people in India. And personally, I would much rather read a novel translated into Hindi than into English of Bangla or Marathi or Gujarati or Kannada or Malayalam or Tamil or any other Indian language. But it so happens that because only English translations are talked about, sometimes we have to bear the travesty of the novel which was originally written in Bangla being translated through its English translation. Now that is... Twice, things are lost twice, in translation. Twice, twice removed, basically. And uh, it goes further and further away from the novel. I will uh, recount a very hilarious uh, incident. I was in a small town of Karnatak. It was called Bagalkot. You probably never heard of it. And Indira Gandhi came there after her Bangladesh victory. She was Durga. So I wrote a short article in a newspaper in English. Uh, saying that, you know, just talking about it generally in a satirical way. And people got very angry that I was making fun of Bagalkot. And they translated it into Kannad and circulated it and said that the CEO, CEO's wife is making fun of Bagalkot. Then I said, I can't read Kannad, which you please translated it into English and send it to me. What they sent to me in English had no resemblance at all to what I had written. Zero resemblance. So sometimes it happens that when you translate via English, the newborn thing is uh, really uh, neither man nor chicken, you know? It is just some weird thing which happens. So uh, my novels have been translated into Japanese and Russian, and they were translated from Hindi. In fact, when my Katgulab was translated into Japanese, first they asked a young boy to translate it. And the reason he gave for not being able to translate it was really wonderful. He said, I have not lived long enough to be able to translate Katgulab. Then a woman my age, whose Hindi was excellent, absolutely excellent. She used to speak colloquial this Hindi. This was into Japanese? Uh -huh. She was a Japanese, and she would speak Hindi like, silvaya hai ki sila silaya liya hai. You know, total colloquial Hindi. She translated it. And I asked, she knows Hindi, but does she know Japanese? Because it's a literary Japanese that you have to know. Then they said three Japanese writers will edit it. But would you believe it? She wrote me 200 letters with queries. And something she asked, one letter was very interesting. She asked, why is your, uh, the maid servant in your novel speaking in English? She says, I've got tops and chain made. Chain or tops to banwa liya hai, baki banana. I said, tops and chain are no longer English. We don't say so. It's only the illiterate people. So it has become Hindi. And she wrote back saying, you are truly international. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so now... I think translation is very healthy in the country. Mm. But uh, we should not cry because USA doesn't read it. 
<laughs> we have survived 2,000 years without being red. We can survive a few years more. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But uh, Rachna, so when you are, uh, you've released this book, Hans, in, in English, uh, what, is the, what is the role that online hubs, there's a lit hub, there's something called N plus one, I think, in the US. All the literary life that's now thriving in the world is on the web. So do you think Hindi literature is enough on Kindle? I mean, does it live the digital life? Uh, it started, we may not need the American life, but do you think yeah, we need the, started, the digital life? It has started living. I wouldn't say it is thriving. It has started living the digital life. People are coming on Kindle, on web. Uh, publishers are uh, doing web books as a separate section because they do realize the importance of uh, you know uh, online reading, which is increasing very, very rapidly. Uh, so it is happening. And uh, we at Hans also now have a website where you can download it online. Uh, because we do realize the importance. In fact, first time now, uh, I have hired a person who just looks after social media in Hans. So, I, because it is a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, medium, <coughs> and one has to, whether you like it or not, but to survive, you have to be active on social media, and survival is a big question with any literary magazine. Hans fortunately has a strong foundation, but still the struggle is like Mridula Ji said, we are still constantly struggling for funds. And you know, coming back to where we started that Hans is the largest. What does largest mean? Largest means we are, cop we are printing 10,000 copies. That is largest. When Stardust gets printed in lakhs, you know, uh, but by te with 10,000 copies, we call ourselves largest. That is the situation of literary magazines, Hindi literary. And when we have the best writers with us. We have the best archival material with us. So that was one of the reasons why we decided to get into translation, because there's such huge material and good stories that we have with us, but they are only limited to Hindi reading audience. And today, a non-Hindi, which is a large section of uh, non-Hindi reading audience, they don't even know that Hindi has so much to offer. So we are looking at, uh, that is the reason for uh, translating Hans in English and uh, web and online is a huge, is a very strong uh, So are you, medium. is it online? Well, uh, Hans Hindi is online. I have purposely not put Hans English online right now because it's just been launched. Want to push in the hard copies in the market and within a month or two months we will be coming uh, online with Hans English. Okay. So you were telling us Yes. There's uh, one very important uh, website in Hindi, if anybody wants to uh, read stories online, Hindi stories, that is not null, N-O-T-N-U-L dot com. There's many stories from all over, you know, Hindi belt. Hindi is a huge world. And uh, they, uh, they have stories and now they've started with novels. Uh, just one novel uh, at the moment, just mine, but uh, they're going to uh, publish more novels online. Okay, so uh, I was just coming to Jason. Uh, you, you mentioned Murakami. You mentioned Murakami, okay. So uh, do you think, uh, you know, to use, a, to use a sporting metaphor, sadly all my metaphors are sporting, you need a Didier Drogba to bring his country into prominence. You need a Vijay Singh in golf to bring that country into prominence. Similarly, one talismanic figure one writer can often do the job for a whole language. It's cynical, but that's what can happen. So do you think uh, that's a possibility? Maybe more translations of, uh, you know, a living Indian writer who can be an ambassador of the language abroad? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I hope I, I, hope I, I didn't want to give the wrong impression that I'm it's such a gloomy picture. I mean, there may be few translations, I mean, not just from Hindi, from all languages um, in the US, but there's a huge appetite and a growing appetite uh, for translations. There are literary journals, Asymptote, Words Without Borders, which are very important places for contemporary literature in translation from all over the world. And there is a real thirst. Um, it's not everybody. I mean, it's people who read literary fiction and people who are serious about fiction. Um, but for not only Indian and South Asian voices, but 
for voices all over the world. So it's, it's actually um, from when I started working as a translator um, about 15 years ago, um, in, a, in a real way, the situation has, has much improved. And yes, um, it's, um, it's the dream, and I think a very attainable dream. Um, we've seen it with like Garcia Marquez in the 70s with the kind of Latin American boom. And I mean, there's such a richness of voices and writers in not only Hindi, but so many, um, so many literary traditions in, in India that there's absolutely no reason why, um, uh, like, like you said, a sort of um, talismanic figure um, couldn't come forward. What we've seen is that usually um, these sorts of figures come forward because of some sort of um, happy coincidences. It's not, you know, something that's planned that um, all of a sudden Swedish crime fiction is going to be the next big thing. Um, and, um, or, I mean, for example, um, I mean, I mean, there are, there are many examples of, of, of cases where a translated book that sort of quote unquote breaks through um, is really just because people read it, they love it. Um, so what needs to happen is for good translators to find good works and then for the right publishing house to be found. And so this kind of matchmaking service, so to speak, is being done. Um, there's no, you know, there's the Sahitya Academy, but they, they, they don't, you know, they do wonderful work, they do incredible work in India, but not as much looking outward, let's say, in the same way. Um, but I, I, I think that absolutely there are so many figures from um, South Asian, and we saw this last year with Vivek Shambhag in a small way with Gachar Gochar, um, <clears throat> and there's no reason why this couldn't be reproduced in, in many different ways. Okay. So somebody who translates her own work, that's, that's a... Sorry, my voice is terrible. <clears throat> so, somebody who translates her own work. So how difficult is that and how important is that? Who else? Well, uh, you know, there was a time when every English uh, newspaper and magazine gave a story every Sunday. So when I was in between novels, I used to translate my stories into English and send them to these magazines. That's how I started uh, translating my stories into English. And uh, I, it helped me, you know, uh, keep speaking English and not forget it, you know, because I had done economics and that was taught in English. And then I started writing in Hindi and I didn't have much to do with English excepting for reading it. So this way I kept my hand at it. And I promised myself that I'll write my no last novel in English, which I have done. Though I, like all writers, I will not keep my word and it may not be my last novel. <laughs> but the last novel that I published is called The Last Email and it is in English. So basically I feel that uh, uh, sometimes it works, a writer translating his own work. But if it's a very big novel, uh, you get very bored reading your own work and then putting it in another language. I translated one novel, Chit Cobra, uh, of mine into English because the translation that HarperCollins had published was so bad, so bad, that everybody was telling me that all your izzat's gone. <laughs> you know, Chit Cobra was a very popular book and they said if they read this English version, they are going to think that it was really horrible. So I translated it myself and uh, called it Chit Cobra because Chit Cobra in any case is one Sanskrit and one English word. So uh, that was how I translated a novel. But also because certain circumstances happened which put me in the same kind of mental attitude or mentality that I could do the same thing in English. But uh, I remember my uh, novel Anitya was translated and was published by Oxford University Press. And the translator just did the first draft and after that, she refused to have anything to do with it. So I, of course, uh, told Mini Krishnan, who is a veteran uh, translator, and you know, she rather a uh, publisher of translated works, and their uh, spinster aunt, so to say. Uh, she said that if you do like that, no translations will ever get published. So let's work on it. So Mini and I worked on it. And uh, would you believe it that towards the end, we talked to each other on the phone for five to six hours every day. Line by line, we went over the script. 
And uh, then she would say, OK, Ma, if you are tired, go and have coffee and come back, like that. And because I have never met another art, uh, editor who was so passionate. After all, it was my novel. It's all right for me to be passionate about it. But I had this lagging. My passion used to lag like anything, and I was damn bored. But uh, Minnie was never bored. And she said that she really enjoyed working with me. So that is how we got through doing Anete. But otherwise, it is both a chore and an exhilarating thing. When the finished product comes, like this Mira Nachi in uh, Hans, you feel really exhilarated that so you've done it So then your job sounds rather hard to please the writer and to keep the translator going. Absolutely. So how hard was this book? Well, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we had a very good set of uh, translators. Who and were they? I mean, if you name a few. Yes, we had uh, Ruth Vanita, we had Rakshanda ji, we had Ira Pandey, uh, we had uh, Ranjana Srivastav and Ridula ji, of course, who translated her own story. Uh, so, uh, and they were all very happy to work with uh, Hans, uh, uh, with Hans on this project. So we just sent the stories. Actually, it wasn't that difficult. We sent the stories and they came back and then Sanjay, ji, Sanjay Sahai, who's our editor, he kind of went through the original Hindi and the English just to see whether the translation has retained the spirit of the, uh, of the story, or the soul of the story. And if he felt certain changes, he dis did discuss them with the, with the translator. And, and that was it. And the trans it, not many changes were required, I guess, because the caliber of translators were very good. And Mridhla Ji, to her, uh, I don't think we even touched her story because she had uh, given the translation. And she, I mean, if who else but her would have maintained the soul of the story. Actually, I wanted to ask you, Mridhla, have you ever translated anybody else's work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did that? I uh, translated a number of stories by Yogesh Gupta. Uh, which nobody, I'm sure, I mean, you might have heard of him because yes, Yadav yeah, talked of him. Yes. But he was a very weird kind of a person and a very good, absolutely uh, offbeat writer of stories. And I translated about 16 of his Hindi stories into English. And the Writer's Workshop published it. Nobody else would touch them, you know. They were just too offbeat. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And enjoy the idea that I had made them more readable. In English, people enjoyed them. It had not happened in Hindi. And I do say that sometimes when you translate it, your own work even, it gets better. Mini called it the second arrow. And I remember this book, Chitakobra, in Hindi, it says, Mere Hum Safar. Now, there, is, there are no synonyms. I want to make it very clear. There are no synonyms. Two languages do not mean the same thing when they, you use a synonym from them. There is no word for mere hamsafar in English. My translator made it my fellow traveler, which is nonsense, which doesn't mean anything. So when I had to translate it, I changed it and I made it, you who want to travel with me through time and space. So of course it was a bit explanatory, but it was better than my fellow traveler or anything like that. So this way, you know, sometimes, when you put it in uh, another language, it is found in translation rather than lost in translation. And Jason would be finding a lot of stories in English, I'm sure. So to just carry on with that point, any challenging f turns of phrase that you've encountered in Hindi that, have, you know, that you've had to transcreate rather than literary, lit a literal translation wouldn't do? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that Mithilaji talked about found in translation because, um, I mean, being a literary translator and a writer, there's no chance that I'll ever become rich. But one um, reason I would like to become rich is I'd like to buy the phrase lost in translation and bury it in a deep hole somewhere and, you know, make sure it's never uttered again on the face of this earth. Um, because it's true, when you have a translation, it's a net gain. You have two original works where, as before, you only had one original work. And um, the, the re-contextualization uh, and uh, reconstituting of the title you just talked about, I mean, is I mean, just so beautifully done. Um, for example, the 
famous book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, the original Czech title has nothing to do with that whatsoever, and the translator, Michael Henry Heim, had to convince and convince and convince the publisher to change it, and the phrase, the unbearable lightness of being, has almost changed the English language in some ways, but I can, I can think of one example um, of a very sort of nice uh, turn of phrase that happened recently. Um, I co-translated a book of the Hindi, the Bhopali-based Hindi writer Manzur Etesham. Uh, the Hindi title is Dastane Lapata, and in English we translate it as The Tale of the Missing Man. And um, it's, it takes place, uh, it's, it's, I, won't, I won't go through the summary of the novel, but these two guys are talking in the 1970s, um, and um, one of them is sort of hinting that the other one might have a little bit more of just a friendship with his male best friend. Um, and he uses the very Sanskritic Hindi word, somlangik, you know, um, which, you know, has a, has a kind of a clinical register, you know, something like this. Um, but then, and the friend doesn't understand somlangik. And then um, he finally uses the English word homosexual. So how to do those two um, registers, and so we, we kind of had this brainstorm. The word lingam is, you know, more or less an English word by now. So the first word that he used instead of somlengik was, we said, same lingamist, um, which has a little bit of the same sound as somlengik. So that was a very nice, uh, one of those moments where you pat yourself on the back and you're very happy and you'll say, okay, this won't happen to me as a translator for another 10 years. But that was, so, yeah. No, yeah. I just want to quickly, while we were going to, uh, doing these translations, you know, there are words which you, where you really get stuck. Sati Savitri. You know, Sati Savitri, we came across ki ek kahani tum to bahut Sati Savitri banti. Now, we didn't know what to do with it. Because we had to, the translator sent it to us saying Sati Savitri. But keeping the international audience in mind, we were giving footnotes, which we were doing in our office. I just couldn't figure out, Sati Savitri, how do I explain it in English? What, what does it mean? It's not a pious woman. It's not a, you know, it's, it, there was no word which, so there are many words which kind of get, get in lost. In these cynical yeah. times, it can yeah. just be a monogamist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, I just want to know if we have any more questions. Otherwise, we're happy to continue for another five minutes among ourselves. There's a gentleman there. Uh, can can a mic please go to the gentleman there? Ah, this is for Jason. See, uh, in 2015, Amitabh Ghosh was invited. Uh, in University of Chicago for four lectures. I, I don't know if you are there or not. I attended two of them. And they were in a big auditorium. There are more than 1,000 people. And Amitabh Ghosh talked about Indian literature. OK. And there was such a good response. All the people, I mean, they are local. Uh, all the people there were very much interested. And also, I found in most of the state libraries, there are at least 20 to 50 uh, Indian language books are there. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of demand and there are a lot of people who want uh, uh, Indian uh, things translated there. And your being a uh, literature department is so rich and you teach in so many South, in South Asian languages that do you have any collaborative plan or anything where your department can uh, uh, do some, I mean, can have more resources for this. No, thank you for that. No, absolutely. There's a huge appetite for Indian literature in the U.S. And yes, I was at the Amitabh Ghosh uh, lectures at the University of Chicago. Absolutely. I mean, still 99.9% .9 of the Indian literature in the U.S. is written originally in English, which is fine, which is great. When I tell people I'm a Hindi translator, who somebody who reads, they say, oh, that's great, some of my favorite writers, and then you see the kind of wheels spinning in their head, and 
you know. Um, but um, absolutely, I mean, as a matter of fact, we just had a visit with Calcutta University uh, this week to discuss various um, maybe potential collaborations with translation and creative writing. Um, and we, you're absolutely right, sir. The demand is there for good translated works. And it's just a question of finding the right connections and the right people uh, to make it happen. I think the mic doesn't like my voice like this. Any other questions? So just to conclude, you know, this has been a labor of love for you, Rachna. So uh, the copies have, are available at the bookstore. So do you want to make a final pitch to the audience about how important this work is and how it's just the start of something that perhaps our own desh, the magazines of Malayalam, Tamar, etc., can also... Uh, you know, take a leaf out of, and perhaps it'll bring back people to the original languages as well. You know, reading a story by somebody in English, and if you know the language, some people might be tempted to go back to it in its original. Absolutely, and uh, especially here in Kolkata, because I know that uh, here in Bengal, the culture of reading and love for literature is huge, is uh, big. So I think... Uh, this particular uh, English Hans is a collection of some of the best stories culled out from Hans Hindi. Like I said, Hans Hindi has a huge archive, some of the best writers, best stories. So we have taken, we are taking periods of five, five years, pulling out some of the best stories, getting them translated, and putting them together as a, uh, they're just stories. Short stories, uh, interesting reading, <coughs> Please do pick it up. It is there in the market. I can show you a copy. One more thing I want to say that the reason uh, somebody asked me that, yeah. So somebody asked me, why not a book? It is, after all, a collection of stories. So why a magazine? And, but my, my answer to that is a book becomes a little more expensive. We have a huge uh, reading or potential readers in students. So a magazine is something which you can pick it up for 100 rupees. A book goes into 300, 400, 200 rupees plus, which becomes not very affordable. Second, a book, uh, the vending places of a book are more formal. You know, they're bookstores. You have to go into a bookstore. Whereas a magazine, I, with Hans, I have a huge distribution network. I can use that. It can go into the deeper interiors of our country. It can go onto you know, railway platforms, footpath. And I want it to be as accessible as possible, which is why the magazine. So please do take it from uh, there. And it has Mridula Ji's stories. It has many other stories. And this is volume one. The next volume will be more stories. We have a huge collection. And eventually, I am looking at it in other Indian languages as well. And uh, Bengali well, does top the list right now. We're looking at Bengali, Punjabi, Urdu, South Indian uh, language, Marathi. Let's see. So thank you, Jason. So you're going to do the job outside. And I hope Hans does the job inside the country. Yeah. And thank you, Mridula Ji, for uh, you know, being present here. And uh, I, I just want you and uh, Rachna and maybe Jason and Mridula could just stand up and hold the copy for a kind of informal launch. I like the feel of this magazine because it is a magazine. As she said, it's not a book. It brings back the romance of a literary journal rather than just being a hard bound, which has a different role in our lives. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, ladies. And uh, do collect the Hans. Uh, what the magazine says progressive literary journal. I think that's reason enough to pick it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Hope you, we, I get, we get your support, full support. Thanks. <laughs>